I work at the New York City Police Division Headquarters as the military liaison. I've been there for two years, um, but I've been a trooper for this is my 12th year that I'm going into. Uh, as the military liaison, I deal with our veterans um, at division. I deal with helping supervisors learn about how to deal with their military leave. Uh, we talk about military law, federal law, state laws uh, that encompass military. I've been in the United States Army Reserves for 14 years as the ammunition specialist with the 962nd Ordinance. I haven't changed units yet. I know that it's coming up for me. I need a little change. I've been deployed once, 2007 to 2008, and I'm a Sergeant First Class and an Acting First Sergeant. Lots of times my partners would call me, especially if it's a veteran, to help them you know, deal and talk to um, veterans that they've either pulled over. And with this situation, it was my partner in the evening, and he said, hey, I think this guy's in the military. Can you come assist me with the traffic stop? And so his thought was he saw some you know, duffel bags in the back seat, and, but the guy wasn't talking to him. No eye contact, said that he didn't have to talk to him. He was saying a lot of stuff like kind of sovereign citizen comments that this government failed him and that, um, he, that the trooper had no authority over him and he was not to answer any of his questions. Um, so I helped the system. We basically got his car towed. We put him in custody and we brought him back to um, the station for further questioning and for processing for DWI. Um, it was evident that he was intoxicated, smell of alcohols, glassy eyes, um, you know, the SFSTs, he did go through some of them with him. Um, so once we got him back to the station, it was really trying to figure out um, what he was all about, what was happening, and how we were going to get him to someone who was going to help him, a family member. Um, so we got his ID. There was no other information. He wasn't giving us anything. And I tried using my rank as a military person to you know, say, hey, I'm, I'm a sergeant in the Army. Um, give me your name and rank and who your commanding officer is. And uh, he hesitated. He was very reluctant to give me anything. He kept saying, well, you're in uniform. You're in this um, capacity right now, and I don't need to answer any of your questions. You have no authority over me. And so we ended up uh, calling, I ended up calling the VAs, I called some marine barracks locally to give me some numbers, um, and we found out that he was stationed overseas in Japan. Uh, I got a commander's number over there, we talked briefly about um, his situation and that he was discharged. Um, so our point from there was to try to just talk to him and figure out if he was getting any assistance. Um, then as we ended up actually looking for his family's information in the phone book and found it. Just by chance we called a few with the same last name and asked if they knew who he was and one person said yes. So when they did come to the station they were already in tears and completely at a loss. They didn't know what else they could do for him and that they had such a hard time already struggling to help him through what he was going through. Um, he wasn't getting any assistance and that he was discharged and that no one else was able to get through to him to help him. Um, that was a huge pivotal moment for me because I, we were, me and my partner were both like, we need to help them too. And so we found some information from the VA and we handed it over to them. And that was kind of like a point where I was like, you know what, I should probably be doing this for a lot more people. And I'm sure a lot of other guys and gals are going through the same thing. And none of our troopers may have the information to lead them in the right direction. Um, just seeing the mother and the brother just in tears, not knowing what else to do, was, it was heartbreaking. They were, I think, relieved. You could tell they, they calmed down a lot from when they first came in. And they, th they thanked us both um, for how respectfully we handled the situation. My partner was completely respectful. He's always been that way with his, um, any contact he makes with people. And he just took extra care. And definitely, when he reached out to me, we made a good team when it came to trying to get this person some assistance and not making a bad situation even worse.
lots of resources I reach through the vet centers. Uh, they're all over you know, United States, so it's not something that if they live like way south and there's not anything, or way west, they can reach out to vet centers that are even on the borders in Pennsylvania and other states. The VAs, we have you know, a limited amount here, so lots of times those are the main bodies, but they have behavioral centers and 1-800 numbers that they can reach out to. There's a lot of websites these days, you know, if they want to start there and stuff that they can resource at home. They actually have a lot of interactive websites. Military One Source is one thing that I thought was very helpful the military put out for me um, and a lot of our troops. It has a lot on suicide awareness, post-traumatic stress, and they actually have interactive and they have a lot of um, members, military veterans that tell their story. So that that's like I think the biggest clue for those who are out there that think that they're at a loss and that there's no way out and then they'll never overcome some of these things that they're going through is to see that someone else is going through them and then they're not alone. Like because the end result for some of these guys are, you know, females are going to be that um, the way out is going to be suicide. Our best program, I think, uh, out of all of it is a military peer program. Um, so what we did was we asked for volunteers. I was part of it, a pilot program way a long time ago when we first started it. So before I became the military liaison, I volunteered to be a military peer, which was kind of attached to EAP role too. Um, they brought veterans that wanted the position to help other veterans. And so when I came into the military liaison position, I kind of took that over and started um, getting them up to par with veteran education, um, some things that they could do benefit-wise for even their families, uh, giving them updated information, obviously through government laws, military laws, uh, other benefits, um, and literally this is their contact, they're like a, a, like a sense of mini-me in troop. So um, instead of having to reach all the way out to division where I'm not close to some of them, they can reach out to these other troopers, investigators, sergeants, lieutenants, I mean all ranks. And these were people that volunteered that wanted the position. And they reach out to them and they say, you know, I need some assistance reintegrating or can you help me figure out what paperwork I have to get in. Uh, I'm not sure if I can do this or do that. Um, or even as simple as, hey, can you watch out for my family while they're away and drive by their house and, I mean, keep in contact with them. Lots of times I would do that myself, you know, call the families or the, you know, the mothers or the wives and, and that worked out a lot. A lot of them know me, you know, firsthand and they'll call me and be like, oh, there's something wrong with his pay, can you check it out? And I'm right in human resources, so it's someone right next door to my office, um, whether it be a health benefit bill that comes in and they just don't understand why it came in, we figure it out and then the problem gets resolved. The emotional connections mainly come from those military peers within the troops because they get to have firsthand knowledge about what's happening. Oh, you need your lawn mode? We'll, we'll get over there on our day off. Um, Sometimes I'll send flowers or edible arrangements or something to families um, on their birthday month um, just to let them know that we're thinking about them. The PBA also does that too. You know, they reach out and send like cookie baskets, which is nice. Um, we do things like uh, during Christmas time or Thanksgiving, we start it. Uh, getting car like uh, cards together. The girl local Girl Scout troops like to do stuff for them. I received it when I was gone, so that was very nice. Um, we send them phone cards. Some of them like iTunes gift cards. Something to let them know that we're still thinking about them and they're not forgotten. Um, new baby arrivals. That's like my favorite time because then I get to send those you know pictures and uh, things like that or any little things. We have some of the women at the office that like to send baby blankets or something. So we're always thinking of little things to let the family know that we're thinking about them. I think it's very important for um, every agency to have a military liaison, uh, even smaller agencies because um, not only would they have personnel that are you know military members but you're also going to have uh, those out there that they're exposed to and it's only going to get greater and greater I and mean, who knows what, how many more conflicts we're going to have. We're still in a, a declared state um, so we're always on emergencies uh, when it comes to things like that. So I think it's very important. I think they should all have one.